Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Henderson Stark, Dumb Supper. Why shucks? Everybody knows black is the color of death. If you see something black coming at you in your dreams, you may just as well give up, because you ain't long for this world. Rosalind twisted in her chair and picked a bit of lint on her wool skirt as she looked at the speaker. You should have seen the dress Nellie bought over in Joplin, the cutest thing. Rosalind extended her legs and looked down at them. They say it cost fifty dollars. My! Rosalind hooked her toe under the rocker of the chair before her and set it in motion. Oh, don't do that, dear, Marcia said. A chair that's empty rocked, its owner will be with ill stocked. Rosalind looked up. I'm sorry, she said. Of course, it may be a little too low for her, you know. She doesn't have the figure. Jean Towers came over and sat down by Rosalind. Don't mind Marcia. She's just superstitious. I didn't mind, Rosalind said. I guess you think we're unfriendly? No, said Rosalind. And they say that they're going to get married next month. And about time, too, if you ask me. I don't think you're unfriendly. I just need a little time to get to know you, and then I'll be all right. Well, I certainly wish Jude would hurry up and ask me. Amy told me your family just moved in last week. Yes, Rosalind said. From California, Fresno. What do you think of Carthage? Oh, Rosalind said, it's, I mean, I think I'll like it. I mean, I am sure I'll like it. Sure you will. It's just that now, at first I mean, everybody is talking about people I don't know in places I... And me too, someone said, and it sent some of the girls off into peals of laughter. Jean Tower smiled sympathetically. You'll get caught up in the swing of things. Uh-huh. Uh, could you tell me? But Jean Towers had left her side. And I said to him, if you think for a moment that... Rosalind picked at the lint again. This was a new town, and this was her first party, and she wanted, oh so very badly, to make a good impression, or maybe they wouldn't ask her again. And it really was her place, she knew, to be friendly. You girls better have a dumb supper. What would you think of a dumb supper, Rosalind? Jean Towers asked. Rosalind said, a dumb supper? Why, I guess, I mean, sure, if you girls want to. I think I'd like something like that. Do you have dumb suppers ever where you come from? Amy asked. Rosalind said, it's a game, isn't it? Not exactly. Well, I guess you might say it was a game, too, sort of. I guess we have something like it back in Fresno, Rosalind said and laughed. For the first time, she was included in the general conversation, and she was happy. Why don't you tell me just what it is, and then I'll tell you if we had anything like it. Well, Jean Towers said, it's kind of a legend. No one believes it anymore, except some of the Peckerwood people back in the hills, and maybe one or two old-timers, like Uncle Alvin down on the river bottom. She made a deprecating little gesture. Of course, there are stories. Maybe you ought to tell her the one Grandma Wilson's always telling. I don't know. Well, would you like to listen to it, Rosalind? Rosalind said, yes. It all happened in the Rush family. They're the Rushers, that is. They're all over this section now. There's a lot of them around Pierce City, and the Roberts of Webb City are first cousins. But this was a long time ago, maybe a hundred years, when they just moved from Kentucky. There was a girl in the family, young, name of Sarah. A pretty little thing, friendly, the way Graham Wilson tells it. Rosalind stared down at her shoe tops, wishing she were pretty, trying to believe what her mother had told her. It's not what you look like, honey, that's important. It's the kind of person you are. And remembering, too, how she looked to herself in the mirror, wondering where she could find a husband for a face like that. Jean Towers said, one night at a party, a party like this, I imagine, when the old people were gone, somebody suggested that they have a dumb supper, just like you suggest things half-joking, half-serious, that way. Sarah thought it was a good idea. They used to do things like that back in Kentucky, and she wasn't afraid at all. Sarah had been a friendly girl. Rosalind wondered how people got to be that way, how they learned to say the right things and do the right things and make people like them. Of course, you understand, a dumb supper isn't really supper. It's just a halfway supper. 
Nobody eats anything, and there isn't anything to eat except two little pieces of cornbread. Rosalind wondered why she was always half frightened by people, why she had to screw her courage down tight even to come to a party like this. She really wanted to like people and have them like her. And after all, everyone here was friendly, and they'd wanted her to come, or Amy wouldn't have asked her. They were nice enough, too, a little different from the girls back home, but nice in their way, and she'd stop feeling like an outsider in a little while. Well, Sarah began to fix for the dumb supper. Now, fixing for a dumb supper has got to be done in a special way. At first, Rosalind thought they had resented her, maybe because her clothes were nicer than theirs, or maybe because her father had a better job than their father's, or maybe because she lived in the big house on South Main, or maybe because she didn't have an accent like they had and talked faster. But now, with them gathered around her, listening, she saw that they really didn't hate her, and it had only been in her imagination all along. Everything has to be done backwards. Everything. Like mixing the batter, striking the match, even walking. Everything opposite from usual. Maybe she was afraid of people because she thought they all wanted to hurt her. In her second year of high school, she could still remember burningly what she had heard her best friend say. Her father had explained it all. You see, people aren't really as bad as you think. They may be thoughtless, but they're very seldom cruel. Most people aren't like your friend Betty. They'd rather be friendly than unfriendly, if you only give them a chance. Sarah cooked her cornbread, doing everything backwards, the way it's supposed to be done, and then she set out the plates, two of them, one for herself and one for her husband. Rosalind was going to be a different girl. She was going to make all kinds of new friends, like Jean and Amy and Marcia, the superstitious one, and she would have the best times talking to them, and parties at her big house, and maybe dates, for she wasn't that ugly, only she seemed to scare the few boys off because she was so timid, but it would be different this time, then maybe. You see, if you do everything just right, according to the story at least, when you set down at your plate with the backward cornbread on it, your husband will come, not really, I mean, but like a ghost, and set down at his plate so you can see his face, and that way you get to find out who your husband is going to be. Oh, said Rosalind, resolving to listen more carefully, for if she wanted to make friends, she must remember not to feel sorry for herself, but to be very polite and listen very closely whether or not she was interested. At each plate Sarah put down a knife. They had funny knives in those days with bone handles, and the one she put at her husband's plate had a big star-shaped chip knocked off of it. By this time the wind was coming up in the north, as it always does at a dumb supper, and you could hear it moan in the trees. It was very quiet in the house, for you mustn't talk, not anyone, at a dumb supper. Sarah put a piece of cornbread on each plate, and then she sat down, as calm as anything, to wait. Everybody was holding their breath, and you could hear the wind blowing louder and louder. Rosalind shivered. She really didn't want to hear the rest of the story. And then, bang, the front door flew open and slammed back against the wall hard, making the house shake, and the wind blew in and made the candles flicker. This was long ago, before electricity. And just as the candles went out, a figure all in white came rushing in to set down beside Sarah. Jean Towers paused, and Rosalind could hear her own heart beating in the stillness. When the candle was lit again, the figure was gone, and the knife that had lain by its plate was gone, too. Is, is that all? Rosalind asked. No, no, that's just the first part. You see, she really got to see its face, or so she said. Well, some time after that, maybe a year or two, a stranger came to town, Name was Hall. Young man, handsome, good worker, although a quiet sort, and not given to talking too much. When Sarah saw him, she knew it was the man who was going to be her husband, for his face was the face of the figure in white. She married him and they went to live in a little cabin on her father's property. Things went along fine for a year, for he was a good farmer and a sober, loving husband. But one day, well... Her father went down to see them, and when he got up to the top of the ridge, the cabin was down in a valley-like, he could see that there wasn't any sign of smoke in the chimney, 
which wasn't right, for it was a chilly autumn day. The cabin was still, as if there wasn't anyone around. You know, sometimes you can tell when you see a house that there isn't anybody at home. Well, he knew immediately that there was something wrong, so he hurried down. And what do you think he found in the cabin? Sarah, lying on the floor. She was lying there with her eyes closed and the knife sticking out between her breasts. She wasn't dead, though, but it was just a lucky thing that her father came along when he did, or she would have been. And she didn't die, either. But it was quite a while before she could get up and around. The doctors didn't know as much in those days. Finally, she told everyone what had happened. That morning, when her father found her lying there in the cabin almost dead, she had told her husband, for the first time, about how she had seen his face at the dumb supper. At first he didn't say anything at all, just sort of stared at her. Then he got up and went to a little box he always kept. He wore the key around his neck and wouldn't let anybody see what was in it, and opened it. He took out the knife that was there on a velvet cushion. And then he turned back to Sarah. So you're the witch that sent me through a knife of hell, he screamed, and then he plunged the knife into her. It was the knife with the star-shaped chip out of the bone handle. And she never saw her husband again. Rosalind swallowed. That, that was awful, she said. Marcia laughed thinly. You mean you actually still have dumb suppers? Rosalind asked. Well, Jean Towers said, not very often. Oh, maybe once in a while. I mean, there's nothing in it, though some of the Peckerwoods would say it was witchcraft. Just for a laugh, you know. You don't believe it, but it does give you a funny, creepy feeling. I think we ought to have one, Amy said. Then Rosalind can see the kind of games we play. Yes, let's. Let's even let Rosalind cook it. How about it, Rosalind? Rosalind said, all right, I mean, if you want to, but let somebody else cook it. Why not? I am afraid I never learned how to cook, not even cornbread. If that's all, we can show you how that's done. Well, Rosalind said slowly, I'll do it if somebody will too. She turned to Marcia. You? I wouldn't do it for the world, Marcia said. Be still, Jean told her. And then to Rosalind, she doesn't believe anything would happen, of course. She, she just doesn't believe in taking chances. All of us here have cooked dumb suppers before. Yes, said Marcia, we have. Well, how about you, Amy? Me? It's more fun if only one person cooks the supper. Oh, I mean, I guess, if you really want me to, of course. Rosalind realized vaguely that it was probably just an ordinary prank they were in on trying to scare her, maybe like an initiation stunt. And if she wanted them to be her friends, she'd have to go through with it and not show that she was scared. All right, she said, I'll do it. Before, it seemed a million times, Rosalind had wished she wasn't so easy to frighten. Even when she was little, the parents had to stay in the room until she was asleep. And now and then, still, she would turn on the light at night, which took all her courage, just to be sure nothing was there. She told herself something that usually worked. She told herself, They will all be laughing about it next week, and then I can tell them how scared I was, and they won't mind at all. She looked at the wall clock. There was no help there. Mr. and Mrs. Pierce, Amy's parents, wouldn't get back from Carthage until midnight. The house was a farmhouse, four miles out of town, and Rosalind had no way to leave, even if she wanted to, for she was depending on the Pierces to take her home when they came back. Come on, Jean said. They went into the kitchen where Amy got the proper ingredients. There were three little cups of them already set out. Rosalind knew, then, that they had prepared for this. Flour, Amy said, pointing. Cornmeal. Baking powder. She drew a glass of water from the tap. Mix the stuff all together and add the water until it's doughy. Salt? Rosalind asked. I thought you said you didn't know how to make cornbread. I, I don't. I just thought it ought to have salt in it. I mean, most things ought to have salt in them. Not this cornbread, Rosalind. There isn't supposed to be any salt in it. Oh, I see. Now, how would you mix these things together? I'd, I'd put the baking powder and the cornmeal in the flour and shake them up, I guess. And then I'd add the water. Good. 
Now listen. Put the flour, the cornmeal, and the baking powder in the water. Then stir them up. Backwards, you see. And if usually you stir clockwise, be sure to stir counterclockwise this time. And walk backwards. And strike the match for the oven away from you if you usually strike it towards you. Everything backwards. All right, I will, Amy. Don't worry. Amy went on explaining all the details, and Rosalind listened, trying to remember, trying to play the game, so they would ask her to parties all the time. It was only a silly superstition, and, contemplating the whole thing in the brightly lit kitchen of the farmhouse, she began to decide that it was really nothing to be afraid of. Just a silly, childish prank, that's all. You ready, then? Yes, I guess so. All right, now, remember this. No matter what happens, don't talk. None of us can talk. That's the most important thing of all. None of us can talk until it's all over. I won't say a word, Rosalind said. Okay, then you're ready? Yes, only first. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but look, you don't really believe anything's going to happen. I mean, my husband come, or anything like that. Amy looked levelly at her. She paused a moment before answering. No, she said. No more talking, Jean Tower said. And there was silence. Rosalind did everything the way she had been told. Everything, that is, but about striking the match. She always struck the match toward herself, and this time, in the spirit of a little girl crossing her fingers before telling one of the little fibs little girls tell, she struck the match in the usual way. After the cornbread was in the oven, she walked backward into the living room and sat down to wait for the ten minutes before it came time to set the table. The other girls, silently as ghosts, had arranged themselves around the room. Their eyes were upon her and she felt uncomfortable, like the first time she, well, she had felt everybody watching her then, too. It was something like that, as if they were waiting for something to give. She thought Jean Tower's face was tense, and Marcia's eyes were... But she was letting her imagination run away with her. Absolute silence, but for the clock. She began to feel the vague, uneasy fingers of fear again. The strangest thing was, none of the girls giggled. They were very still, waiting. They were serious. She heard the monotonous tick-tock, tick-tock of the clock. There was the picture of the Indian, looking hopelessly into the chasm, there on the wall. Drooping spear. Tick-tock. There were the goldfish over in the corner, slowly circling. Tick-tock. There was... Her heart leaped toward her throat. The clock had stopped. Rosalind choked back a scream, and her nails dug into her palms. Slowly she relaxed. Only a clock had stopped, and clocks often stop. Every minute, day and night, somewhere in the world, a clock stops. Maybe the girls had arranged for that, too although it was a little difficult to imagine how they... She looked at first one and then the other, and tension began to mount within her again. Their eyes were bright, and they seemed to be leaned forward, tense, watching her. Her father had said, People aren't really as bad as you think. They're very seldom cruel. She tried to believe that. It was time to begin setting the table. She had to fight with herself to stand. The eyes shifted upward with her. Even if they hated her, she wasn't going to quit, to show she was afraid. Not now, but they would all laugh about it tomorrow. She began to walk backward toward the kitchen, hair along her neck bristled. Silence. She began the slow, awkward process of setting the table for herself and for a guest. And then from far away, she tried to close her ears to it. The second plate clattered loudly on the table. She felt tears form, and her nose wrinkled and tingled. She could not scream. She could only move forward toward the door, take two knives. The expression on their faces, and she knew now, they did hate her, each of them. They were straining, listening, holding their breaths to hear it, and it grew louder. She hated her, maybe because her father had a better job than their father's, or because she didn't have an accent and talked faster but they hated her. Rosalind forgot about them. She was at the table again, and her movements were forced from her. She wanted to run and scream and cry. She put the second knife before the second plate. 
It had a good stainless steel handle. Wind in winter. Wind from the north, moaning in the trees. Wind in winter in southern Missouri. It always comes up at a dumb supper, Jean Towers had said. Mr. Pierce had said that evening that it was going to be a hard winter. But wind in winter? Marcia's eyes were glassy, and her breath came short. Screaming wind, tearing at the house, gripping it, shaking it. In winter? She took out the cornbread, using a potholder to keep from burning her hands. She cut it into two pieces. The cornbread was soggy. She should have baked it longer. She put the large piece on his plate. She felt herself sitting down. There was nothing else she could do. She tried to fight, but her muscles were caught in a clammy vice. There was terror in her mind, overflowing it. Three goldfish in the living room were still circling slowly. The icy wind seemed all around her, caressing her, kissing her, muttering, muttering, like an obscene lover. Weak, she was weak. Her skin crawled. Something from outside. Outside what? Just outside, that's all. Outside of everything. The girl face is now. Blank, wide-eyed, drained. Waiting, waiting. She tried to move her lips, and the wind stopped them with a frozen kiss. And then the wind was everywhere. A laughing, insane fury. A cold, musty breath. Frozen. Everything was frozen. Time stood still. Waiting for her husband to come. He came. She looked up from her plate and saw him. A shadowy figure, unreal, tenuous, flowing into the room flowing toward her. Her heart beat, beat, beat. He was going to sit down beside her, her bridegroom. Wind, evil wind. The lights faded, growing weaker and weaker, and the white-wrapped figure, settling into the chair, prepared for it. It turned its head and stared full into Rosalind's face. She found that she could scream now. Her voice was shrill, and it went on and on and on in the darkness. Finally, the lights came back on. The girls were circled tightly around her, their faces tense. What did he look like? Marcia asked. He, he, it had no face. It wasn't my husband. It was only, only blackness, awful black, blacker than the blackest night. She was sobbing. There, there now, Jean Towers said. You mustn't cry. Take my handkerchief. It's nothing to cry about. No, said Marcia, you mustn't cry. Suddenly the girls were bustling around her, wonderfully sweet and nice, drying her eyes, saying soft words to her, leaning over backward to be helpful. Rosalind was shaking. Let me alone, she begged. Please let me alone. You hate me. I know you do. Shucks, no, we don't either, Marcia said. For a moment the words seemed to echo in her mind, and then they began to call up new echoes. Suddenly she came to remember it, an overheard scrap of conversation. She knew the meaning of black and why they were being so nice to her. For Marcia had said, black is the color of death. And she knew, too, who was ultimately to be her only true friend and bridegroom. The End